Well, it's November 3rd, and over the past few days in many Christian traditions, uh, there have been some holy days. Friday, November the 1st was All Saints Day. Yesterday, November the 2nd, was All Souls Day. Now, these two special days are rooted in a, a kind of reverence for people now past, now died in faith, who are remarkable and influential and godly. There's all kinds of saints, uh, more than we could ever count. People like St. Bridget of Kildare in Ireland, St. Francis of Assisi in Italy, um, the 20-something martyrs from Uganda from the 1880s, uh, St. Mark Z. Qingxiang of China. There are saints from all over the world, more than I can keep up with, and the roster of saints actually varies depending on the Christian tradition you're a part of, whether you're Orthodox or Anglican or Catholic or maybe a tradition that has its own kind of unofficial saints. Now, in some places, uh, Christian veneration of saints uh, blends with a, a sort of indigenous veneration of ancestors, which is pretty common around the world. And when those two things to get, come together, really beautiful things happen, uh, like Dia de los Muertos, which is celebrated down in Mexico. It's one of the most beautiful and holy days of the year um, where folks recognize that we are all a product of the generations that came before us, that even though they are their past, even though they have died in faith, even though they are not physically with us, we are here because they were there. Now, I myself didn't grow up in a tradition that officially recognizes saints. Uh, growing up Southern Baptist, any talk about sainthood was usually viewed with that kind of special Southern Baptist anti-Catholic suspicion. Uh, some of the customs around the recognition of re and reverence for saints still feels a little foreign to me, and it might be to you. I've had conversation with some of my Catholic siblings about who's the patron saint of this and who's the patron saint of that. I have a picture next to my television at home of St. Clair, St. Francis's sister, and St. Clair is the patron saint of television, <laughs> in case you were wondering. <laughs> Because she had visions, like clairvoyance is named for St. Clair, and a television is a vision of something. Sometimes it's really interesting like that. Do you know who the patron saint of Toronto is? What's our big hospital called? There you go, St. Michael. Um, I had to look that up, but it makes perfect sense. Um, no matter how formally or informally we recognize and celebrate them, saints are everywhere. Saints are all around us, all across our shared history. And in a way, a saint can be anybody. When the Apostle Paul was writing to Christian communities around the first century Mediterranean world, to communities in Rome and Corinth and Ephesus and places like that, he often referred to people in those communities as, as saints, and not just the, you know, especially pious in the groups. He said everybody. Um, he'd say, to all our siblings called by God to be saints. Uh, and in our own metropolitan community churches tradition, our founder, Reverend Elder Troy Perry, um, has been fond of sending letters to churches with the opening Dear Saints. That's how he refers to folks like us. Maybe he knows something that we don't, but yes, dear saints. So yeah, saints can be anybody. If you've been in uh, any sort of faith community for any amount of time, you might have noticed that there are saints in those communities. Uh, when I was pastor of a little church in Richmond, Virginia, Westover Baptist Church, there was a woman named Thelma Cosby. Miss Thelma, and she was the children's Sunday school teacher in that church for more than 60 years. There were senior adults with gray hair, retired folks, who had been children in her Sunday school class, and my oldest child was one of Thelma's very last Sunday school pupils as uh, Miss Thelma died in faith shortly after we moved here to Toronto back in 2013. And if you think about your history in a faith community, those of you who've been going to any kind of church for very long, you can probably think of folks like that in those communities. Before Thelma passed, we put a plaque on the wall in the children's Sunday school classroom with her name on it. We named the classroom the Thelma Cosby classroom. She spent a lot of her life and de dedicated a lot of her time to it. And if you'd gone around that congregation and said, who are the saints here at this church? One of the first people that would have been mentioned, undoubtedly, would have been Miss Thelma Cosby. And if I could go around and ask every one of you that kind of question, there are people you could probably think of. 
folks of all shapes and sizes, is making all kinds of contributions in every faith community. I think we could come up with a very good list of names. So no matter how long those lists might be, there's always room for more. Because saintliness, sainthood, is for everybody. It's not just for those special figures throughout our history who are important and influential, even though that is a big deal. We all have it in us to be saints. And I like this broader view of the community of saints. I like this broader view of being a saint. Um, Because when we do that, when we zoom out a bit, we meet a lot of people who are like us. We find kindred spirits. And we get reminders, and we often need these reminders, that our story, our tradition, is not as narrow as some might imagine it to be. I fell in love with church history when I was studying to be a minister in seminary. I was the teaching assistant for our church history professor, uh, another professor who had taught church history. I asked him once, you know, how he got into church history. And he said, it's so wonderful because you get these new students, and and they often, because this is how our churches tend to form us spiritually, they often come with this really narrow view of the Christian tradition because a lot of us like to think we're the only ones that count. And then you get to come and introduce them to this huge roster of people, some of whom they would find very far afield, some of whom they would find very progressive or very different and without really any agenda other than to say, this is your family. These people belong to that great communion. And it's a lot of different types of folks. Last Sunday morning, JJ shared a wonderful lesson for life with us that introduced queer theology into the part of the story, into part of the story of the preparation of the upper room for Jesus and his disciples to share the Last Supper. Now, queer theology, which some of you have have heard that term uh, a number of times here at MCC, is rooted in the wider sort of academic field of queer theory. And that can sound intimidating or professorial, but It really begins with a simple premise. This is how queer theory works. We recognize that throughout history, people have existed outside the strictures of cisgender heteronormativity, which means, in other words, whenever society has figured that being heterosexual and cisgender, that is not trans, and monogamous, whenever they say those things make you quote unquote normal, and you know, some people still think that, there are always going to be those of us who exist outside of that idea of normal. Proudly, <laughs> some of us. And, and there are a lot of us um, who, who do exist outside of that little circle. And when you're outside of that circle that people call normal, you just see the world differently. That's where it all begins. That's what queer theology and queer um, theory begin with. Consider the story of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8. It's a story about a guy reading Isaiah, and he's wondering, as he reads the story, he's seeing the story through his unique worldview, and he's asking, what's this story about? Could this story be about me? Could there be someone like me in this story? We all bring a different sort of like me to our experiences of reading scripture or practicing faith or just being in the world. Queer people see the world differently And we approach scripture differently, we approach faith differently, and we approach the idea of sainthood differently. There's a wonderful um, thinker in MCC life named Kittredge Cherry, and Kittredge has done extensive work on identifying queer threads in the stories of saints. And there's a couple different ways that this happens. Sometimes it means recognizing parts of the lives of saints from far, far in the past that would be considered queer today, even if those figures couldn't identify that way. Saint Augustine, uh, third, fourth century uh, leader of the church, one of the most influential thinkers in Western history, had intimate relationships with men and with women, and today we might call him bisexual or pansexual. Now Saint Augustine couldn't identify that way, but you get the idea. Saints Sergius and Bacchus from the 4th century seem an awful lot like what we would call a gay couple today, whether or not the church recognizes them as such or not. You can kind of 
infer. Saints Perpetua and Felicity might be considered a lesbian couple today. Saint Sebastian, a third century Italian um, killed for professing Christianity, has long been associated with homoeroticism. He is basically a gay icon. He is the patron saint of, of lots of LGBTQ folks. Now, these historic figures, of course, would not have understood sexuality and gender and identity the way we do here in 2024. But still, maybe we can see a little bit of ourselves in their lives, in their experiences, in their stories. And maybe these threads, these connections that bind us to them can come as a bit of a reminder that we are not alone. And just another way of reminding us is as Catholic priest and gay activist, Father James Martin likes to say, well, a certain percentage of humanity is queer. That's just how it is. And so probably some of the saints were too. Martin says, you might be surprised when you get to heaven to be greeted by queer people. Sometimes we find sainthood in different places uh, rather than seeing historic figures through a, a different lens. Sometimes we see contemporary queer figures and think of them as saints. Uh, Silvia Rivera, for example, the Latina drag queen and trans activist and Stonewall riot veteran, uh, at the end of her life was a faithful member of MCC New York. And at the time of her death, one of her final wishes was that her beloved faith community would start some type of outreach to um, unhoused queer youth. And so at MCC New York, to this day, there's a side organization called Sylvia's Place for queer youth who wouldn't otherwise have a place to stay. I think of Sylvia Rivera as a saint. I lost my, I lost my first Tumblr. I think this is my second Tumblr. And it has a sticker that says, queer joy is sacred, and it has a picture of Jesus saying, ah, comma, men, and I don't know how to interpret that. There's probably a lot of ways you could. <laughs> Frustration, desire, whatever. But my first one had a sticker with Sylvia Rivera on it, and she's one of the saints to me. If you see it, just drop it off by my office door, please. Um, or if you see one of those stickers, grab me one and I'll put it on my new one. Um, Harvey Milk, the first, uh, the openly gay San Francisco city councilman uh, assassinated uh, in November 1978, the day I was born, by the way, um, is enshrined with an icon in our chapel. There's also an icon for Reverend Pauli Murray, who some of you heard me talk about during Black History Month last year, the year before, Pauli was a civil rights activist, uh, an incredible uh, legal scholar and lawyer, a women's rights leader, um, one of the founders of the National Organization of Women, and she was a priest. And she found herself attracted to women. She wrote about this, and she even explored the possibility of gender transition. And she is enshrined in our chapel, in our interfaith chapel, in an icon. And I think uh, there's a second copy of it up in Dina's office because that was one of the gifts that we gave her the day of her installation. Reverend Bob Wolf stole this thing that I wear. A stole that belonged to Bob Wolf is, is enshrined in our chapel as a way of remembering and holding sacred the life of a man who came to Toronto from California back in 1973 on a one-way bus ticket to be the founding pastor of MCC Toronto. I think we can certainly consider Reverend Bob and lots of folks like him to be saints. Now our sacred stories tell us that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, a communion of saints. In some Christian confessions, one of the things that we confess we believe in is the communion of the saints. In other words, there is this huge community not all living in the way we understand, that surrounds us and are still part of our family. And we recognize that this can be because we worship a God, which as Sean shared with us, is a spirit that can breathe life into the driest of bones. A God who, as Jesus said in John 6, has this will that nothing that belongs to God should ever be lost. Nothing that God loves can ever really be gone. Now, 
I mentioned the hymn that we sang at the beginning of the service for all the saints. Um, Make a note, if you're here the first Sunday of November next year, we're going to sing that hymn again, and it'll probably be the same. It's, it's the All Saints hymn. It's one of my absolute favorite hymns. And like a lot of things that we, a lot of the language we use in church, the text of that hymn has been updated for the 21st century. Um, I, I always welcome that kind of thing, even though there's a little piece of me that likes the original language. Uh, it was written by a guy named William Walsham Howe back in the 19th century. He was an Anglican minister, known for his work with children and the poor, and he wrote it back in 1864. My favorite stanza of that song, which I don't think has been adapted into one of the ones that we sing, goes like this, and you'll hear the language. O oh, blessed communion, fellowship divine, we feebly struggle they in glory shine, yet all are one in thee, for all are thine. Alleluia, alleluia. All are one in thee, for all are thine. As Jesus said, nothing uh, that God creates, nothing that God loves, nothing held in God's heart ever leaves God's heart. And in some way, in some way that we don't completely understand, there is this oneness that transcends what we know of this life and makes of us one family. Back in, I want to say, the 1990s, there was a church historian named Roberta Bondi who wrote a kind of spiritual autobiography called Memories of God. Uh, Roberta, like maybe some of you, like me, grew up in a very conservative Christian tradition, and over the course of her journey of faith, found herself in more and more progressive Christian spaces until eventually she became a church history professor at Emory University down in Atlanta. And in this autobiography, she writes about um, figuring out and coming into an appreciation of feminine visions of God. God, especially as a mother. And she says something about how mothers hold children in their hearts and how it reminds her of God. I want to share this word with you. She said, It has always been the deepest of mysteries to me that my mother has an intimate knowledge of me as a baby, as a child, that I myself can never have access to at all. It is, it is as though a fundamental part of me has existence only in my mother's memory. And when my mother dies, this part of me will die too. In the same way, God, my mother, holds the whole of me forever in God's ever-present memory. And God will never die. Nothing that God treasures, nothing that God loves will ever be lost. And so we can confess that those that we have lost, those who have passed on, those who have died in faith, are somehow still part of that great communion of saints. And I know that's been on our mind a lot lately. Um, last week we dedicated communion to Henry um, the day before that was Joe's service. Um, today, we're dedicating communion to Trish. Next week, we're dedicating communion to Stephen, whose service is going to be Friday. We have all these reminders in our community um, that the people that we love and the people that we lose are really never lost. Not just because they're held in our hearts, but because they're held in God's heart. And God is eternal. We can all be saints. We can all be part of that great communion. And we are all part of this huge family. And it's a good family to be a part of. Amen. Amen.